I'm Greg Bamber and speaking from Melbourne, Australia. And when we're having a meeting in Australia, one of the traditions is that we will acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, past, present and emerging and, and recognize that ownership of the land in Australia has never been ceded uh, from their ownership. And I'd like to move on and introduce the format of this webinar, first of all, by thanking Lyra for hosting it, Bernadette and Emily in particular have been beavering away behind the scenes. And we have people from four of the countries that are included in the new edition of the International Comparative Employment Relations book that has just been published and four of the country teams are going to present a 10 minute summary of a few of the current issues in line with the theme adopted in the book in alphabetical order, which is Canada, Germany, South Africa, the United States, and then a distinguished Tom discussant, Tom Cochen, is going to make sense of everything that he has heard and distill it in discuss it in 10 minutes. And then Ginny from Cornell is going to moderate a discussion and question and answer session. And so if you have any questions or comments along the way, please post them in the chat and then we'll have an opportunity to discuss after all of the main speakers have presented. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Daphne Taras from Ryerson University, and she's going to be joined with by Scott Walsworth from Saskatchewan, and perhaps by Sean O'Brady from McMaster University, and they're going to give us an insight into employment relations in Canada. Take it away, Canada. Okay, we are we are Canada, A. Eh? Um, <laughs> we are, Alex Corbin laughed because he was Canadian. Um, <laughs> we are in one paragraph a mature industrial relations system which gave constitutional protection to collective bargaining and the right to strike through some fairly recent Supreme Court decisions. We're about just under 30% unionized with by far, by far the most membership in the public sector. So that's in a snapshot what it took us many, many pages to write um, in the chapter. And Scott Walsworth um, has been introduced and, and Sean O'Grady is, I guess, in the same province as me now, Ontario. So I'm in the middle of downtown Toronto, but we've decided in our talk to focus on three matters that keep us up at night worrying. And um, the first matter is uh, the current status of the employed. And like a lot of countries, uh, we know that there's been a real disproportionate effect on gender, on caregivers, and on income earners from the pandemic. That there are some very interesting dynamics from sm some smaller communities. Um, and there have been some uh, breakouts of COVID in both nursing homes and meatpacking. And I thought I would draw attention to the easy explanation between uh, meatpacking and nursing homes, two industries that normally wouldn't be linked except for the pandemic. A low paid and sometimes unpleasant work for new Canadians, especially of color, tend to be for the women in nursing homes and senior care and for the men in slaughterhouses, because this is an entry into the Canadian economy. But they live together in very congested housing in the town, so there's no surprise when industries cross-contaminate in seemingly unrelated workplaces. Uh, we're seeing in Canada the terror, like you all have, the terror in major cities of people getting into elevators where people are living in rented apartments. Um, there are some major social inequities being brought to the fore that are very visceral um, during the pandemic. And the only thing that I can say that's worth keeping an eye on as a labor relations response is some movement towards compensating wage differentials. There are some nursing home conglomerates, some retail sector that have offered an extra $2 an hour for people who take on this 
difficult work, this risky work. So there is some adjustment in the labor market. And there are other signs such as preferred positions in the vaccine lineup priority, which is giving um, some you know, social acknowledgement of the um, stigma and the different leveling in society. So those are interesting uh, things that have come to the fore with regard to the employed. Then we turn to our second point is the most fragile. What has happened with precarious work, job insecurity, income loss, um, workplace COVID risk, and the right to refuse unsafe work. Um, so in this um, group of problems, um, we, a lot will depend on how quickly the economy will rebound. And we're seeing all this pent up demand for tourism, for hotels, for restaurants. And we don't know what's going to happen with the rebound and whether things will recalibrate. But there's massive government cushioning uh, through benefits and through employment insurance to tie workers over. So there are a couple of really interesting things that arise from this point. The right to refuse unsafe work will soon be reimagined as the right of workers with compromised immune systems or living with family members with compromised immune systems or particularly difficult family circumstances. And in Canada, there's a move towards family status accommodation, which is not, are you married? Are you single? Do you have children? Do you not have children? But how difficult are your family circumstances? And we're still waiting for the Supreme Court of Canada to rule on how family status discrimination will roll out. But within that, the COVID pandemic response will be an interesting illustration. So I will be watching family status accommodation and the right to refuse unsafe work. And the fact that work for some people is more unsafe than others. It's raised new issues. The third area that we wanted to talk about is the role of unions in the pandemic. And we've seen unions very active, um, teachers unions calling for school closures, United Food and Commercial Workers calling for a COVID bonus for retail workers. Uh, one response is by government. The Ontario government has put a 1% compensation cap on collective bargaining benefits, but it's leaving it to the parties to negotiate exactly how that 1% will roll out. So it's a little bit less draconian response than what other Ontario provinces did that caused our Supreme Court to react in certain ways. But it's still very concerning, especially when governments are going very deeply into the red. Um, by and large, when I've looked at union movements in Canada, I see opportunistic scrambling rather than any coherent movement among unions or indeed among employers. So I see more of a collective holding of the breath. In Toronto, in major cities, we're working at a furious pace with employers and unions and employees to figure out how to bring about agile workplaces for the pandemic recovery to solve both family status problems, economic problems, and so on. Um, there's, I don't know if other countries in the world are experiencing this, but in Canada, there's a very mysterious rising housing price problem that nobody anticipated. And it makes absolutely no economic sense that everywhere housing prices are going through the roof. But what is happening is a lot of employers are talking about amalgamating locations, allowing employees to work from home, giving freedom and flexibility to employees who were once disciplined for being 15 minutes late three times in a row. If you're 15 minutes late, you're going to be called out for discipline. Now, all of a sudden, those restrictions seem to have been gone as long as someone is getting the work done. So the pandemic is... Um, revealing things about workflow, how it's measured, how it's monitored, how it's corrected. It's revealing inequities at work within the same job classifications. And certainly in our union movement in Canada, which is a lot pink collar, we'll be entering a new era of close supervision through, you know, the eye in the sky, through, through Zoom, through electronic surveillance. Um, and so 
will be giving some compensating wage differentials to employees that must appear at the cash register at nursing homes or night cleaning shifts or mining operations. And perhaps um, we'll be looking at the employees who are given agile workplaces as enjoying more freedoms. I'm not sure whether that will fizzle out as a movement or whether it will be permanently integrated into the Canadian work site. But I can tell you as a labor relations scholar, I will be looking very carefully at collective agreements in a year or two to see how brand new provisions are being introduced through negotiations. So in closing, those are the three things that are keeping us up at night. I worry about the younger generation having to pay the costs of COVID. And now that I'm particularly gray haired, um, I'm looking at my grandchildren as paying for costs. I don't know how unions in a business unionism environment, which is Canada, can actually influence public policy in a way that would redress some of the generational inequities that are going to be caused. So the long-term effects on pensions and benefits is unknown and the dreadful jolt that we've all experienced, it has implications for the next 50 years, but I'm not sure what's going to happen in labor relations. So, you know, we talked about compensating wage differentials. We talked about collective agreement provisions, but we're still in the middle of it. So that's our, that's our Canadian setting. Thank you. And if Scott and, and Sean need to say anything. I would just add they've one got, small. They've got one minute if they wish to say anything. <laughs> okay, Sean, I'll take 30 seconds. <laughs> I would just add one point that builds off what Daphne said, um, and that is just to remind the group that we're very highly unionized in the public sector in Canada, close to 85%, whereas in the public sector, it's closer to 19%. And my sense is that there's a collective sense of dread for the immediate future as governments uh, receive less and less in, in terms of uh, revenue and are spending more and more. I think there's great concern in the big public sector unions over job security and also on the pressure of wages. Uh, and I think there's also a feeling that the general support level for unions in the country is likely going to take a hit in the immediate future. I would agree with that. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Sean, you've got about 30 seconds. <laughs> I'll just add one point too. Um, I, I think one thing I've seen, I've seen from somebody who looks at precarious work in Canada is that the pandemic has highlighted uh, the weaknesses of our decentralized bargaining system. Um, so, you know, when you think of grocery stores, there was a hero pay, as we call it, um, an increase in pandemic pay, which everybody thought, great. Uh, this was largely voluntary on the part of employers. Unions might have said it was related to negotiating in some way, but it wasn't. And then the employers rescinded it. Unions fought it like heck. Um, in the Maritimes, there was even a strike related to poor working conditions in a Dominion grocery store. Uh, this was a Unifor that did this. Um, but what we've seen is they've actually had almost no influence over the changes in working, disruptive changes in working conditions from the pandemic. And uh, I would anticipate, and people might speak of this later, that the story would be quite different in other countries. Um, for example, Scandinavian countries or continental European countries where bargaining is more centralized and uh, rights to consultation, worker consultation are more extensive. Thank you very much, uh, Daphne, uh, Scott and Sean. And without having any discussion at this point, let's move the spotlight to Bernd Keller in Germany, who has got a, a less challenging task in one sense, because his co-author is not able to be present with us today, so he can uh, He's got 10 minutes himself to give us a summary of some of the key developments in employment relations in Germany. And Bernd is a professor emeritus at the University of Konstanz. And he's, he's co-authored the chapter in the book in the last several editions. So over to you, Bernd. Yeah, thank you, and good afternoon from Western Europe. <laughs> Unfortunately, Anya, my co-author, can't make it. Our system of homeschooling is still going on, 
So this creates a lot of additional problems for all parents. So I'm the only uh, presenter. Uh, Greg uh, submitted different subjects for a discussion and I decided to select two. One is part of our national responses to the health uh, pandemic. And I would like to introduce and to discuss with you a very prominent um, instrument of labor market policy. So let me say just a few words about the present generation. The overall GDP shrank last year by 5.3%. This was almost the amount of shrinkage in the financial and debt crisis in 2008-2009. And this was the most important financial crisis since World War II. One consequence is, and I guess this has also been pointed out for Canada, that sectors were un or are unevenly affected. So manufacturing is more or less not at all affected, whereas some private service sectors um, have been hit very seriously. There are even some beneficiaries like supermarkets, like online commerce or delivery services, but it's extremely difficult for hotels, restaurants and bars, cultural and creative industries and parts of retail. So how do we try to cope with the, with the crisis? I do not want to elaborate on higher public expenditure. This is well known from all countries and also for the European level. I would like to mention or, and to talk a bit about a specific labor market instrument in Germany. And this is called short-term allowance or short-term compensation. And it means payments for employees to compensate for their loss of earnings that result from temporary reductions of weekly working time. This instrument is very old, but it has never been very famous. It's also only of importance during a serious crisis like in 2008, 2009 and, and now. Payments result from the uh, statutory contributions to the uh, unemployment insurance. And the equivalent is 60 to 70, 67% of your regular pay. And this can increase after four or seven months. And you get this, um, this payment for usually for 12 months. And nowadays the rule has been extended to 24 months. So what does it mean? It creates a so-called win-win situation for both sides. For companies, it means that companies maintain their company-specific know-how, especially experienced men and women power. And after the crisis, company, companies have no additional hiring costs. For employees, it means that their jobs are saved that massive layoffs are avoided and it prevents a significant rise of unemployment and the substitution of, of income, of course. And more recently, and this is quite interesting, this instrument has been more or less copied by some other um, European countries. So what do we know about the effects? It's still very early, so, but there are some preliminary results. So in the spring of 2020, in the spring of last year, about 6 million employees were working short time. This was almost 20% of the total labor force. This number has increased, uh, has, has decreased during the summer and during the fall, but then it has increased again during the winter and spring up to more than 2 million. But, and this is the, uh, the uh, effect of the short-term allowance, Overall, unemployment has only slightly increased. Most recent studies that were published only last week show that uh, about 2.2 million jobs have been saved by this short-term allowance. So this is quite impressive. And the number is supposed to increase towards the end of, of the crisis. So this does, and this is my final point in this part, this does not mean that there are no 
uh, present problems. One problem is, of course, that this instrument is fairly expensive and uh, it is paid for by regular contributions to the unemployment insurance. And if this is not enough, by, by public subsidies. But anyhow, these payments are much lower than payments for high unemployment would be. And there is no doubt about this um, proportion. Uh, there are still problems for low wage earners. I guess this is uh, again comparable with uh, Canada and this problem has to be solved, for example, by a, a higher substitution rate uh, for these low wage earners. An interesting or final unresolved interesting problem is that these uh, time frames could be used for additional training. And we, we know from preliminary empirical results that this does not happen, but we don't know really why it doesn't happen. So it is quite obviously that, that there is an uh, urgent need for additional qualification of training. There is working time left to do this training, but it doesn't happen. We have to find out why this is the problem. Okay, this is uh, one point I would like to mention and probably to discuss with you. The other uh, point has to do with the impact um, of digitalization on, on work. And this is, of course, a very broad topic. Um, the interesting point I would like to mention has to do with, with co-determination in, in Germany. I do not want to elaborate on necessary trade union activities and collective bargaining and so on. This could easily be the topic for another webinar. I would like to talk about uh, German works councils, and, and, and I guess everybody knows, and you have probably read our chapter, uh, that this is the, the, the focal ingredient of this dual structure of German industrial relations. The history of works councils goes back to the Weimar Republic to the 1920s, and the, uh, the law for the, for the present situation was passed in 1972 and has not really been upgraded since then. Now the uh, pandemic shows very clearly that it needs a basi basic upgrade in two different regards. One is the, um, the um, introduction of digitalization measures, uh, measures in um, the existing economy. And it's quite obvious that instruments that were introduced uh, in the uh, Fordist uh, times and for this regime of production are not sufficient anymore. The other reason is the, uh, the forthcoming um, introduction of the, of the platform economy. And this part of the economy is definitely more or less completely unregulated. And we need to introduce some, some basic rules for uh, co-determination issues in the platform economy. So the, uh, the draft of this uh, so-called uh, Rich Works Council's Modernization Act um, has been introduced in federal parliament. It's within the political process and the decision has to be made pretty soon because our next general election will take place in September and the process has to come to its end uh, before, um, before the summer. So let me just mention a couple of, of points that might be of interest um, without going into too many details. And whoever is going to write a, a chapter on Germany for the eighth edition of ECIR will have to rewrite this part on co-determination from scratch. So one, one point is the felis, uh, uh, felicitating the establishment and election of works councils. So coverage rates of works councils are down to 40%. And this rate has of course to be increased and election procedures are fairly complicated and have to be made very easy. The second point is the simplification of digital work. And this is so far completely unregulated. This 
would include things like video conferences for works councils, electronic signatures for, for documents. It would also include another or a further extension of the concept of, um, of, of companies and also of, uh, of employees. So all these gig and, and cloud workers have to be included one way or the other, and they are completely excluded now. It would also mean that works councils have to have more rights in uh, continuous training and, and further training. And the, the idea of the, uh, um, of the draft is that they should be able to take the initiative, the initiative to introduce uh, measures of um, continuous and, and further training. Artificial intelligence is of course another broad field and quite in general, the regulatory framework we need for mobile work. And this is more important or has become more important during the pandemic than it has been before. The problem, and this is the end of my remark, is that coverage rates are fairly low. As I mentioned, they are at about 40% now and they have decreased since the early mid 1990s. And even if we manage to pass um, this, this draft, it will only cover less than half of the present workforce. And nobody knows what is going to the other half. Anyhow, this pillar and th this constituent part of German co industrial relations will be changed very soon. And we'll have to find out to during one of the forthcoming seminars, what possible consequences will be. So that's what I have to say. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you, Bernd. And there seem to be some interesting changes taking place in Germany. We had a Lira webinar only a year ago where there was some discussion about the responses to the pandemic. And it was a very different picture that Ginny presented then of Germany compared with the, the picture that you have painted today. But perhaps we can come back to that in the discussion and let's move along now to South Africa, which is included in the seventh edition of our book for the first time it's a pleasure to welcome two of the South African contributors to join us in this webinar, both from the University of Cape Town, uh, Johan Marie and Asanda Jonas Benya. And some of us were lucky enough to visit the University of Cape Town on one or more occasions when it hosted meetings of the International Labour and Employment Relations Association, which is the international umbrella body that Lira and other national associations belong to. So, Johan and Asanda, please take it away and enlighten us about South Africa. And I think you're going to share your screen, Johan, with us. I, 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 am, I am going to share my screen. I'm going to do that now. And, and once, uh, I'm afraid, I, um, my, my system stopped and it had to re-zoom again, so I hope it doesn't happen again. Um, but I'm, I'm now going to share my screen uh, uh, with you. Um, and, and you should now all have uh, a, full, a full view of it. Um, I'm, I'm uh, going to, um, just let me, let me do a little bit more here. I'm going to, a talk about labor and employment relation challenges in South Africa. Um, and I'm, since it's the first time South Africa is in the book and, and it, uh, I'm going to give a, uh, some background just for, on the country and on its employment relation systems and how it's come to be what it is. From there, I want to cover what is a, a major development and we're all holding our breath uh, uh, as to what's going to happen, and, and you'll, I'll reveal to you as I speak what, what that is. Um, and uh, uh, then I'm going to cover a topic that I'm very glad the Baron uh, also covered. I'm going to talk about the South African effort to, to implement the equivalent of, of co-determination and, and works councils here. 
Uh, finally, I'm going to say a little bit about the impact of, of COVID-19 uh, on in terms of global supply chain. Um, but the main coverage of what COVID-19's effect is on South Africa, especially the sort of economic and social effects, uh, uh, Asanda will cover and, and I, she'll also deal with, the, with gender issues in South Africa. Um, so without more ado, um, uh, South Africa is the second largest economy in Africa uh, after Nigeria. Uh, but it does have the most industrialized and diversified economy in Africa. Um, and probably, as you can see there, the manufacturing constitutes 16% of value added to our uh, gross domestic product. Um, and it was much lar larger, but as um, happens in most more developed countries, the services start taking over and become bigger. So trade is 14%. Mining, which used to be very big, has shrunk a bit to 7% and agriculture to 2.5%. And the two largest uh, sectors are, are finance and, and services in the South African economy uh, in terms of value added to the GDP. Uh, South Africa has a population of 59 million people and it is a multicultural society. Um, and that's an important thing to bear in mind as um, black Africans make up 80%, so 81%, so the over overwhelming proportion of the population. Uh, Coloreds, uh, that would be a term people are not familiar with, but in South Africa, uh, colored people call themselves colors and they're a community. They are, they are the descendants of, of the original Khoi and San indigenous, uh, uh, a lot of them now call themselves Bushmen, the original San. Um, and also the result of slaves from uh, the, the, the descendants of slaves from, from uh, Asia. From, uh, so, uh, and they've come to make up a, a community. Um, they make 9% whites who are the descendants of settlers from Europe, mostly Britain and Holland. 8% uh, uh, and then Indians and Asians, uh, people from Asian origin make 2% of the population. And uh, there are very big cultural differences. Uh, um, colored people, uh, although they've come from indigenous stem, are, are mostly Afrikaans speaking, which is what half of the whites speak more or less. And, and they, uh, so uh, uh, their culture is very different from, from other groups' cultures. So that is just an important factor to bear in mind uh, when dealing with South Africa. Um, to go to employment relations, the, the background of it is that it was the discovery of diamonds uh, and of gold in the late 19th century that, that really started, as it were, the in, in employment relations system we have today or the, and the employment system uh, because it, it initiated migrant labor uh, uh, that has persisted up to the present time that the, the mine owners and some of them became very big and rich and wealthy. They recruited and became big corporations, mining houses. They recruited African labor from South African so-called reserves uh, where uh, whites never really settled and were dominated by blacks and also neighboring states, uh, especially Mozambique, but also Zimbabwe and Zambia and so on. And, and, and they had a monopoly in recruiting. So these labor was unskilled and was very cheap. On the other hand, there was skilled labor was needed in the mines and they were recruited from, from Britain and Australia. And these, these skilled white mine workers quickly formed guilds and unions to limit their, uh, their supply. Um, goodness, uh, 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 and uh, yes, to, to limit their uh, supply and keep expensive. In 1922, there was a revolt when the employers tried to replace black with white workers. And, and as a result of that revolt, the Industrial Conciliation Act was passed that introduced industrial councils, but it excluded African workers, African male workers from industrial councils, so they couldn't participate in the industrial councils. Um, the, now fast forward from 1924, to 1994 with our political transformation to a constitutional democracy with a bill of rights uh, that, uh, that gave workers a right to form and join a trade union and to strike. And the new government passed uh, the Labor Relations Act of 1995, 
uh, that kept industrial councils but changed them to bargaining councils. And the big thing is that that they um, were um, extended full rights to form unions and to strike uh, 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 to the public service workers for the first time. And those unions have grown very large and very strong. And now fast forward to 2021, and the current public service unions are negotiating their wages and working conditions with the state. Um, now, a background is that the South African state, due to a combination of incompetence and corruption, has gone into uh, enormous, enormous debts. Um, it, it, uh, it's about 200 billion US dollars. Um, it's a phenomenal figure in South Africa. And, and the Minister of Finance announced a wage freeze. Uh, it was supposed to pay a wage increase for a three-year agreement and just said, we're going to have a wage freeze. And of course, the, um, the, um, th there was immediate outcry from the public service um, and, they, uh, and they threatened uh, to go on strike. Um, and negotiations are still taking place. And uh, it all takes place on one bargaining council, the Public Service Coordinating Bargaining Council. And um, the, according to the General Secretary of that council, 98% is highly unionized. And over time, they have, they have increased their wages and their employment enormously. Uh, so they, uh, they have a, everything from an 18% to 30% higher wage than the private sector. Um, but the, the, in negotiations, the deadlock was reached soon, and the, the Minister of Public Service heading it, the state side, asked for the public to comment, to look for solutions, and we now have an, an, a conciliator from the ILO who is trying to reach a settlement, but we think it's to no avail, and we are holding our breath as 1,3 million public service workers right across the country might go on strike soon. And, and it's going to have a devastating effect. No police, no, no teachers, no medical staff, except, of course, for emergency workers. But that is a, a major concern at the moment in, uh, in this country. Um, the other thing is I want to touch on uh, co-determination that an innovation in the Labor Relations Act was the introduction of workplace forums, which are based on the German co-determination system of works councils. And the person who played a very big role, or played a role certainly in it, was no other than, than uh, Professor Manfred Weiss, the former president of, of ILERA. He served actually on the drafting team of, of the Labor Relations Act of 1995. Um, and and uh, it, the unions were represented, and they tried to make it as acceptable to the unions as possible. But Unlike Germany, where the unions embraced works council, as Brent Keller pointed out, 40% of private sector workforce are currently covered by them. South African unions have rejected workplace forums. And, and research, I've done some research and other research over, show that over the past 24 years, only 128 applications to register workplace forums have been submitted. And research to try and find <laughs> to find one that's working has not has now of late not produced a single one. We cannot find a single work workplace forum that exists and is functional uh, in the country. Um, you know, Johan, yeah, yes, Johan. Am I, my time up. I'm already yes. I'm so Very, sorry. I'll, okay. I'll stop there. Um, okay. Over to over to Asanda. Thank thank you, Johan. Oh. Very interesting, and you, you of course elaborate these arguments much more in your chapter in, in the book, which people can refer to. Asanda, welcome, lovely to see you. Mm. Thank you, Greg, and uh, thanks to the colleagues who've already spoken. I think I am going to just go straight to the COVID 19 impact uh, on work because I'm not going to touch on gender because we already do not have time. But just to say that when we in the book, we talk about gender equity in South Africa, and I think part of the points we're making in the book is how the conception of equity in our employment relations or employment legislation has been very narrow. And I'm not going to go into that. I think I'll just focus on the impact of COVID-19 in South Africa. But I think uh, one, to understand and to appreciate maybe the impact of COVID-19 in the country, one has to take a 
a somewhat longer view and not just look at 2020 or use 2020 as a starting point. The fact that we are one of the most unequal countries in the world, we've been battling HIV, TB, diabetes and other comorbidities for the past 20 or so years, uh, even before the 20 or so years, the socioeconomic realities of the country and also especially rather for African households, I think these are things that one needs to sort of keep in mind as we talk about the impact of COVID-19. I think it was Canada earlier that talked about the disproportionate impact that it has had on women in the country. It has also had a disproportionate impact on African households. So things like social distancing or physical distancing, sanitation, how do you do that when you don't have proper housing, but also how do you do that when you don't have running water? So it was really impractical for people to observe these COVID protocols because of the communities that people live in. And of course, the ailing public healthcare system, and especially in our rural towns. But most importantly for workers, I think what is important to keep in mind also is that for South Africa, by the end of 2019, the economic growth rate was already very, very slow, if not stagnant. That's what economists say. We were already in a technical recession by the third quarter of 2019. And uh, some people are saying this technical recession, uh, it has been worse, not just bad, but worse than even the 2008, 2009 recession that we saw. So when we had a lockdown in March 2020, we were also facing what some saw as the inevitable downgrading of the South African economy by Moody's. And indeed, shortly after we went into the lockdown, the downgrade was, in, was, was confirmed. And so these are things that I think are very important to keep in mind as we think about the impact of COVID-19, the fact that the country was downgraded a week after lockdown and then we shut down everything and, uh, and the impact then in, in, in light of all of that. And obviously the disproportionate impact on poor and working class households. Uh, in fact, less than two months after lockdown, uh, in South Africa, about 3 million people lost their jobs, and most of these were women. Some didn't just didn't lose jobs, but they lost income because households and jobs were closed. So uh, one thing to point out is that uh, it was not just women and, and these working class households that were impacted, but also migrants from the region. So while the president, as a way of mitigating some of the, the impact of COVID-19, they introduced a certain um, they introduced certain ways of helping. Well, the emergency, for instance, the emergency, the 500 billion emergency rescue package, which was about 26.3 billion US dollars. Some of this went into healthcare, but some of it actually went into workers. So we had the unemployment insurance fund that was. Um, that put together or developed the COVID-19 temporary employer employee relief scheme. So this was specifically targeting employees and employers. We also had things like the social grants that were distributed to about 10 million households, unemployed people rather not households. And this helped in terms of reducing the number of households that went hungry. While there was this money that was put, uh, that was provided by the government, there's been lots of uh, people saying that it was badly implemented and obviously also corruption. So despite these measures then by government, when one thinks about the impact of COVID-19 on people, despite these measures uh, by the government, unemployment has not been unabated, abated rather. So we've seen in the past quarter, for instance, statistics that were released a couple of weeks ago showing that if anything, the unemployment rate has been going up in the country, again, uh, emphasizing the impact of that on youth, on black people, and women especially. And also if you unpack the statistics, you see that it's particular jobs or particular sectors that have been hardest hit with those consumer facing services sector being those that are hardest hit. There's a lot that one can, um, I mean, there's a lot that we talk about in the chapter and there's no time unfortunately to go through that. But just as a way of concluding is that what for us in South Africa, what started off as an, as an economic outcome that was worse than the 2008-2009 recession, it's actually turned out into a nightmare. And some economists argue that it is the worst economic downturn in the country since the Great Depression in the 1930s. While our economic, uh, macroeconomic problems in South Africa are structural, historical, these have all been exacerbated, exacerbating our challenges and ability to wade through uh, the crisis.
the people who've been the most affected are also the biggest shock absorbers of all of these crises that I've just talked about in addition to COVID-19. I think I'll end it there and, and hand back over to you, Greg. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sandra and Johan. And forgive me uh, hurrying you up, but there's some interesting things coming out of these remarks to discuss, and we mustn't forget the United States, which is where most of the people on this call are located. And we're very fortunate in having the two contributors from the United States to the last several editions of the book who are both with us today. One is a former Dean and Provost at Cornell of the ILR School, and one is the current Dean of the ILR School. And the clue is the current Dean has the picture of the ILR school behind him as he's speaking. The former dean's looking very relaxed, uh, lying back. Uh, and I think the former dean, Harry's going to go first briefly and then leave some time for Alex to follow on. Is that right? Uh, just the reverse, Alex is going to go first. Okay. okay. Well, it's, uh, yeah. Um, I'm also noticing that, that clearly uh, Daphne and I both went to dean school because we're advertising our schools uh, in our <laughs> backdrops. Uh, uh, Shout out to Rutgers there. Um, so in the United States, uh, there's some underlying trends that in our chapter we, we talk about that uh, we've really seen continue over the last period. And the two big ones, uh, two big ones are this kind of relatively weak uh, collective representation. Uh, we, you know, we all know the story of kind of lower unionization that is declined over time in the United States, um, but, but really development of this uh, characteristically individualized employment relations system um, in the United States. And, and at the same time, um, an increasing legalization of the American system. And that's a really important part of the, of the story in the United States. And we've really seen that continuing just in this most recent period. Um, on the legalization part, uh, uh, there's two decisions we talk about in the chapter. Uh, uh, the Janus decision uh, that uh, dealt with the uh, question of um, public sector uh, agency clauses. And essentially uh, the Supreme Court uh, decided that in the public sector in the United States, uh, a, a national right to work law was essentially uh, gonna be created by the courts. And it's sort of a remarkable thing to think about, right? The breakdown of the American public policy formation uh, system in the, in the labor realm, right? Uh, uh, we have a uh, labor statute that uh, dates back to the 1930s and 40s. And, and we've seen relatively little uh, success in public policy updating, but we've seen the courts stepping in and uh, changing things based on kind of development of legal doctrines. And Janus is a, um, uh, a massive kind of indicator of the court's willingness to step in and craft uh, legal doctrines that have, have really profound labor relations uh, impact. Um, now, interestingly, it, it was less uh, far reaching than I think some of us in the field feared. Uh, there was certainly some discussion that it might end up creating a kind of national right to work um, standard, saying that uh, you could not have any kind of agency um, arrangement where uh, workers represented by unions in a collective bargain agreement could be charged for uh, representation fees for that representation. It was, it was confined to the public sector, uh, though in America currently uh, uh, similar to Canada, but a lower level, public sector labor relations is um, about half of the American uh, unionized workforce um, and a much higher uh, unionization level, uh, retaining uh, unionization of over uh, just over 30% versus we're seeing down to around 6% private sector uh, unionization. Uh, the interesting thing with, with Janice uh, that we saw in the fallout is both kind of the, the, the impact of legal changes, but also the limitations of them. Um, there was a lot of workers paying these agency fees beforehand. Uh, most of them stopped paying the agency fees, but we didn't see public sector union members dropping their memberships and stopping paying dues. And that was, that was a really interesting uh, 
uh, outcome after Janus and something that you know the unions have been very afraid of and actually did a very successful effort to uh, bolster membership support to, to reach out to their members. That uh, was one of the kind of positive side effects of it. But I think also reflected uh, the research that's been done showing that most American union members are very satisfied with their union membership, appreciate uh, the value uh, of that. Um, the second major legal decision is uh, when Epic Systems, and this deals with mandatory arbitration, um, uh, a really big phenomenon in the US that now covers over half of American non-union employees where their individual employment rights have to be uh, resolved through an employer established system of arbitration rather than going to the public courts, uh, a privatization of justice and privatization, I guess, is another American theme of labor employment relations, private structures and the uh, weakness of the public sector. Uh, the significant thing from labor relations standpoint uh, is that this also suggests a court move away from support for collective rights. There's a weakening in it of our section seven rights for collective action. So again, this American trend toward individualization driven by the courts uh, being a really big theme there. Um, the other um, um, uh, aspect I'm gonna touch on that's related to this kind of legal legalization aspect in America is uh, around the digitalization of work, right? This theme that um, Berndt uh, was talking about in the German context. In America, this has been a big legal debate um, around the status of, uh, of uh, gig economy workers, uh, whether they have employment rights or not. And really ground zero for this has been in California, where California, initially the courts crafted a broader definition of who's an employee, what we call the ABC test, it's sort of a simpler test um, that uh, more broadly recognizes kind of the economic realities of the situation in classifying uh, workers as uh, being employees and, and having employment rights. Um, this is then followed by the California legislature passing uh, basically a codification of the ABC test and a statute called AB5. And then a quite a remarkable reaction last fall um, where the uh, 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 rideshare companies, Uber and Lyft, launched a massive campaign to exempt themselves from this. They got a proposition passed, Proposition 22, um, that I guess uh, apparently was the largest singly funded uh, proposition in, in California history. They uh, took about $200 million into this and uh, uh, successfully got uh, this proposition passed by the voters. Um, in weird American st style, this is only applies to rideshare drivers. So they're the only part of the gig economy that gets out of the rules. For the rest of workers, um, who gig economy workers, the ABC test, AB5 still applies. So it's, it's, a, it's almost like private exemption from um, uh, government regulation. Um, so uh, strange, but very American. Uh, the latest update on this is that New York State, there's been reports of discussion going on currently between some unions and Uber and Lyft to come up with a sort of quasi sectoral bargaining alternative to um, regulation of uh, the drivers as employees. It's not clear exactly what this involves because it's being secretive. Uh, it has not been released what the proposal is. And there's a lot of skepticism in the community about whether this is actual sectoral bargaining or not and what exactly it will involve. But this is the latest thing um, going on in this respect. Uh, maybe I'll uh, stop there and pop over to Harry to follow on. Um, thank, thanks, Alex. Uh, let me just first thank uh, Greg and the other co-editors, um, both for putting together this webinar and for the hard work involved in herding we faculty cats uh, with a C-A-T-S cats uh, into this kind of comparative volume, which is no simple task. So what I'm gonna highlight is just a few developments that sort of pick up on some of the things Alex has mentioned that focus in particular on recent developments and trends in union strength, the strength of collective bargaining, and also the strength of collective actions uh, that may not necessarily involve unions and collective bargaining. So uh, first on the private sector side, as Alex has highlighted, um, private sector unionism is at an a, a extremely low level, uh, 6.5%. And here's my point, is even in the face of extremely innovative efforts at organizing, there's no sign of an imminent spurt in growth in private sector unionism overall. 
Uh, we, we now, uh, many would say, fortunately have a president that openly endorses uh, collective bargaining and unionization. Um, many of us were looking at the recent vote of Amazon workers at Bessem, in Bessemer, Alabama, as sort of an interesting test to see if with the encouragement of the president and the other things going on in our economy, we would see uh, a vote for representation. And that vote not only uh, failed, but it failed overwhelmingly. Now, uh, some would argue uh, that's all because those difficulties are all because of the deficiency and limitations in our law. There's currently an effort, it's called the PRO Act, to change the law. Um, I have two things personally to comment. I won't speak for Alex on this. I think it's very unlikely the PRO Act will pass Congress. And I also wonder, even if it did pass, I'm not so convinced it would lead to the enormous turnaround in private sector membership that the labor movement hopes for. But let me turn to something a bit more optimistic, and that uh, is signs of life in collective action in the United States, where if you would just look at the private sector membership numbers, you would not suspect there is uh, so many signs of life. Um, one is, just to elaborate on an important point Alex mentioned, even in the face of Janus, the Janus decision by the courts, and financial pressures in the public sector, public sector union membership has held up rather strongly. It's in the mid-30s at the local and state level. It's also held up at the federal level. So even in the face of those challenges, public sector unionism has been uh, quite, quite uh, strong. Secondly, even outside of, of formal unionism in the public sector, particularly for teachers, many of us were struck by the wildcat strike action that took place a couple of years ago, starting and then it's still occurring in some places in states, West Virginia and Oklahoma, and among them where unionism is not strong, we've seen teachers, again, often acting outside the boundary uh, of unionism and collective bargaining, uh, taking rather strong uh, collective action and achieving some some gains in terms of forcing legislative changes that improve pay and working conditions for public sector teachers and all. Uh, a third point, uh, it's not just teachers. There are many rights groups that have formed in the United States. Many of us, uh, some would say us collective bargaining geezers, I'll speak personally for that regard, not project out onto Alex. You know, would would criticize us for being so focused on unions and collective bargaining, and many of us are waking up, being dragged by our more innovative, often younger colleagues, to recognize all the collective actions that are occurring, not just by teachers, but by many others outside forms of unions and collective bargaining. That involves taxi drivers, the Taxi Driver Alliance, uh, home care workers, other health care workers. Uh, farm workers, the Amokali Coalition among them, many other uh, collective actions uh, uh, ongoing. Uh, questions remain as to whether those actions will get institutionalized, how long they can survive, whether they will lead, uh, as early public sector unionism did, to eventual collective uh, bargaining and, and unionism. But the fact of the matter is those uh, rights groups are acting uh, collectively, and, and, and in some cases, achieving noteworthy uh, gains. Again, they're often, not always often linked to immigrant rights issues, which are really important, and, and, and many of them are troubling in the United States. Um, a fourth point, uh, I just want to return sort of the basic collective bargaining and also say, um, in, in so, some private sector unions are alive and well. Uh, professional sports. Uh, we often overlook that heavily unionized, high-paid athletes bargaining collectively, using their grievance procedure to protect them. Uh, pandemic issues. Uh, a number of unions stepped up and, and did uh, important things for workers uh, in their jurisdiction. Auto workers, the AFT and the NEA who represent school teachers, the SEIU and others who represent healthcare workers, uh, the UFCW in trying to protect uh, workers uh, who work in in, in retail uh, stores and, and and also in some meatpacking and, and all important actions often taken at the shop floor level uh, to uh, force management uh, to provide uh, personal protective equipment and 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 do other steps that provide health and safety uh, protections. Of course, we all wish there were even more of those. We wish 
the past administration had been more aggressive. Uh, the new administration, fortunately, is itself in OSHA and other uh, agents through agency activity being more aggressive. But again, unions have played a really important, uh, helpful role. Um, another point, um, uh, sort of stepping outside collective bargaining, even beyond this kind of workplace collective action, there's been important legislative gains. Uh, again, many of us, users, myself included, were quite skeptical uh, that the labor movement uh, could promote uh, um, improvements in the minimum wage uh, through the fight for 15. Enormous success, again, varied across states. Another point Alex mentioned, too, and just to build up very varied action at state levels. Some states uh, passing legislation, not just about uh, the, the minimum wage, but in other arenas. But anyway, back to my basic point, important collective action, legislative action. Again, we don't think of the United States as being a showcase for that kind of legislative a political action, but there have been important uh, changes. And last but not least, just to mention one last point about the pandemic. Um, uh, there, there were very significant federal actions taken that were not typical of the United States. There was a federal support for unemployment insurance, which is, is typically uh, uh, driven and financed at the state level with enormous variation in the benefits and coverage that workers receive. Well, Congress passed uh, several bills that provide substantial uh, federally provided uh, financial support. Now, there's great debate about the levels of that, the consequences of that, but one shouldn't overlook the fact that this was quite novel for the United States, for the federal government to be so active. The federal government was also active, fortunately, due to the strength of the Democrats in Congress to provide parental leave and sick leave. The United States stands out, as many of you know, among the so-called advanced countries for not being advanced in the kind of national legislation that exists regarding parental and sick leave. But there were some important measures adopted as part of the pandemic relief initiatives. And of course, it remains to be seen. One can, one can be hopeful there. I think that uh, it's possible that the election of Joe Biden and the changes that have occurred in the Congress can be built upon in the next elections, and we may well see further legislative action that it would be meaningful uh, to extend those kinds of federal benefits and make us look a bit more like the social democratic countries that are covered in the comparative volume. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Harry and Alex, for enlightening us about the United States. And I'd like to pass the baton to our good friend, uh, Tom Cochan, who I've been lucky enough to work with on several projects, one of which is was in the airline industry that you didn't mention, Harry, in your um, areas which are highly unionized, uh, at least in uh, some of the parts of the aviation sector in the United States, another sector that's been, of course, devastated by the uh, pandemic and where the federal government has intervened, as I understand it also. But uh, let me now pass to Tom, who's kindly agreed to make some discussant remarks. Over to you, Tom. Thank you. And, and I should say, I, I guess Tom really needs no introduction, but just in case there's anyone who doesn't know that Tom is the uh, professor of employment relations at the MIT Sloan School, but I think is in the process soon of transiting, transitioning to become an emeritus professor at uh, MIT Sloan. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, and, uh, you know, this concept of uh, emeritus, this is just a fancy word for saying you stop getting a paycheck, but you can continue to work and do what you want to do. So that's my definition of, of whatever this damn transition transition is going to be. Uh, this has been such a rich discussion. And the book itself is a major, major contribution. I'm going to make uh, comments first a little bit about the, the, the evolution of this volume from the first to the seventh edition. Uh, and, uh, and then I want to focus on this rich discussion that took place here today, which uh, is really pointing to where our field is going. And I'm going to then end up with uh, a term that I've just invented, that we have a, a, a Humpty Dumpty problem in this field that's going to have to be addressed in the eighth, eighth edition. Uh, 
And uh, those of you who have children, grandchildren know that there's this uh, children's story about Humpty Dumpty where the pieces fall apart and somebody's got to put them back together. That's where I think we are right now. We're experiencing a, 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 a breakup of a lot of our concepts and our ideas and the focus. And it's going to take the next edition and the next generation of scholars in our field to put it back uh, uh, together in a coherent way. But let me start with a comment about the book uh, that brings us all together. This is you know, clearly the premier comparative uh, employment uh, relations book uh, uh, of our time. It's gone through uh, an evolution of seven uh, editions. I think I was there to uh, watch the first one. And basically what it's done over time is it's moved from a uh, comparison of national systems. Yes, you still have South Africa, or in, in newly uh, uh, introducing South Africa, Germany, the US, Canada, and so on. But the focus that used to be on comparing these national systems has really, really uh, moved on. And it's moved on uh, incrementally uh, over these uh, seven editions as new research. You mentioned the airline industry, Greg. Uh, uh, you know, as we, you know, we, we've done comparisons with industry focus uh, uh, across national boundaries. And you see that uh, sectoral emphasis uh, embedded in more and more in recent uh, editions. The work that, that Harry and Oban uh, Dabashire did to really emphasize that we can compare um, uh, particular issues and see commonalities, but yet divergencies. Uh, and that uh, more micro analysis is, is apparent in, in the, my reading of the chapters of the book, the work that uh, Rose Bott and, and then Ginny uh, has carried on in terms of looking at a particular sector like call centers and then comparing across and learning from all of those. Those are all the rich pieces that now are informing the way the book has evolved and the way in which our authors are, are addressing um, these issues. And I think that's a real contribution. We're moving from national comparative systems without much of a conceptual framework to then debating whether varieties of capitalism for all its, its contributions and its warts uh, is a framework or whether we have to use growth models as uh, some of our colleagues. And so we're still searching for frameworks that will allow for systematic comparison across national levels. But the real focus is going much, much, much more to micro level uh, institutional developments. And then I'm gonna suggest even beyond the institutions. I think that's the real contribution of, of your volume over the years we're indebted to you and it gets richer and richer with new uh, and emerging scholars, younger people coming in uh, as we've seen uh, on this, uh, th this program here today. That's, that's a tribute uh, to, to the work. Now, what I'd like to pivot then to is look what happened here today. Uh, this conversation, a uh, rich conversation, almost uh, was independent of the content in the chapters in the book, because everyone is so focused today on what are we learning from this uh, disruptive experience of COVID, uh, the disruptive experience of recognizing the essential nature of work that's being done by low wage workers, by immigrants, by people of color, by women, the growing role of, of gender equity and racial equity and uh, the social identities that people carry into the workplace, whether they're immigrants, that all came out in uh, the conversation here today. And I would say it's kind of moving beyond the institutional focus uh, that uh, is so much a part of our field, looking at, yes, the co-determination, looking at the labor movement, looking at collective bargaining, but unless those institutions are going to be able to learn from and adapt in a, uh, a post-COVID period, then we're going to see a de continued decline of those institutions. And I think the conversation uh, uh, from Germany and South Africa and Canada and the U.S. all emphasize that the institutions of collective bargaining are under tremendous uh, stress. Works councils and co-determination need a new act and a new way of, of thinking about it. Um, the public sector in South Africa is, is, is falling apart and, and maybe uh, facing a crisis. 
And as Daphne and, and colleagues said, in Canada, we're seeing similar kinds of pressures and pressures to respond more effectively to a world where there's a gig economy, where there's digitalization of, of, of our practices, where there are new entrants and new players that uh, don't fit well with the existing structures and new forms of collective action. That's the Humpty Dumpty dimension. All of these are really the, the, the central um, debating points in our field. And whether we will be able to see our institutional arrangements and our laws really get updated to cope with these realities and these things that are driving uh, uh, what's going on in our workplace today uh, or not is gonna be the defining question of our field moving forward. And I think the defining features that will show up in the eighth edition of this fantastic book. So I, I look forward to this. I, I think we, we do face some really tough choices in our field, both uh, from a policy standpoint, from an institutional uh, 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 innovation standpoint, and from a scholarly standpoint. Uh, we are a field that has always moved across those boundaries. Uh, we are having debates in the United States about whether there will be some form of labor law change. I agree with Harry. There's little prospect that the existing bill is going to go anywhere. And even if it did, that it would have much of an effect. That we have to have much more fundamental change in our, our policies and in our institutions. There are uh, lots of interesting developments occurring. Uh, uh, in the regulatory side that may push us toward uh, things that I never thought uh, could happen, that we might have some new sectoral arrangements, call them wage boards, call them safety and health committees in your state of New York, uh, Alex and, and, and Harry, that I think uh, just got safety and health committee legislation passed. I don't know where that's going, but those are gonna be the issues our young colleagues will be addressing in the future. I think they're gonna move our field forward. I think it's gonna be much more from a bottoms up, looking at these individual experiences around gender, social identity, essential workers, inequality of, 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 of experience and opportunities uh, for what we now call essential workers. Those things are gonna drive people, uh, our, our students to really re-engage um, uh, the field. And they will then ask, are the institutions up to the challenge of, of addressing these issues? And if not, then either we go beyond the institutions or we fundamentally reform them. I think those are the debates that are in front of us. I think it's an exciting time. I think uh, this volume and the collection of authors have really done us a great service in highlighting them. And this discussion tells us where we need to go uh, uh, as we move forward on all of these, these issues. So thank you for the chance to, uh, to, to listen and to read and to, uh, to comment. Thank, thank you, Tom. I'm going to hand over to Ginny now, who is one of the bright younger colleagues who's joined the team for this edition as co-editor of the book and made uh, an added value to the team uh, greatly. So, and Ginny's going to moderate the discussion now. So Ginny, over to you, thank you. Thanks a lot, Greg. Um, and thank you for Bernadette and Emily for helping to organize this and all of our presenters for really stimulating thoughtful presentations. Um, I have been looking at the chat and I've seen a couple of, a lot of comments and a couple of questions. So I will just, um, I think because there are just a couple of, of actual questions, I'll call on those two people and um, suggest that the presenters look at the comments uh, and see if there's anything in there that you would like to respond to as well in your, um, in your comments. So the first one is from Joel Gershenfeld. Um, Joel, would you like to pose your question directly? Sure, I, I, I'm, I'm delighted to do so. Um, in a sense, my question um, follows on from Tom's comments, which is that it was stunning to hear in every case um, how the institutions are not being agile and adaptive in the current climate. And we heard from Harry 
um, a little bit of hope and optimism of some alt labor developments and even some traditional developments in responding to COVID. But I guess my question for any of the panelists is, do they see in any innovations uh, what we call bright spots? You know, it might not be an entire new architecture for labor and employment relations, but um, what we call uh, weak signals, early indicators that they would like to lift up as potentially pointing the way towards what will be needed for working institutions in the 21st century. Thanks, Joel. And then I have another question from Stephen Sylvia. Would you like to ask your question, Stephen? Sure. Hi. Hi, Ginny. Um, so my question is, it sort of follows on Joel's about the question of innovation. And, and one of the things that struck me, it, it may have been just the presentations uh, focused on things and didn't get to this point. But one of the things that's striking me is that given the, the economic impact and the workplace impact that we're going to see from climate change uh, when it comes to electrification of cars, when it comes to air transport, um, and when it comes to things like a recent German Supreme Court decision, which is forcing the German government to um, specify exactly how they're going to meet climate goals, that the, the issue of the impact of climate change on work is substantial and will really reorganize everything. And I didn't really hear all that much about how um, how uh, employment relations institutions in general, unions in particular, are dealing with that issue. Okay, thanks. And I would love to take more questions, but since we only have 10 more minutes and we have a lot of presenters to answer, I will take, um, I will ask my own final question <laughs> and then turn it over to all of you to answer. Um, so, this question really regards um, going beyond the comparative lens. So in our book, um, in our conclusion, we try to not just talk about comparative developments, but think about international employment relations within multinational firms and across their value chains. Um, this was sort of mentioned by a couple of the presenters, uh, but not really explored in great detail. And I was listening to the news um, in Germany the other day, and I heard that there, the Bundestag is, is voting on this Lieferkettungsgesetz, um, which is going to focus on um, provide new um, responsibilities for companies to monitor um, conditions across their supply chain. Um, so I wonder for Bent if he could reflect on this or make a few comments if he has any. And for others, do you see implications under COVID um, for these supply chain policies of, of companies in your countries? Is there anything uh, for us to understand and those kinds of implications? So that's it. And I will now turn it over to um, the, maybe we'll go backwards and have the US team give your final comments in response to questions or points raised by Tom. I yield to Alex. <laughs> uh, sure. Well, I'll, um, um, maybe I'll go in reverse and, and uh, come on Stephen's uh, uh, question first. Uh, so the climate debate stuff has been interesting, right? The, the, in the United States, there's been um, a significant segment of the labor movement that's that's been part of the kind of blocking coalition against uh, climate action. And so you've seen this uh, Debate within the labor movement. It's been interesting following it in New York State, um, uh, you know, which is where I've been most uh, familiar with that. And, and we have a unit within the ILR school that's been working with a, the labor movement within the state to try to uh, to try to get a kind of union um, uh, position around climate uh, jobs uh, that's that's constructive in in climate action uh, with, with some success, right? Um, you know, it's been interesting seeing that um, uh, there's been a uh, increasing move to kind of pull together a coalition, uh, including building trades unions in, in the New York City, greater New York City area um, in support of uh, climate jobs for New York State and getting behind uh, offshore wind um, as well as other um, climate 
jobs action within the state. Um, but it's but it's been clearly a big struggle, right? And this is uh, this is I think being fought out uh, very much at kind of a, a um, local level of between particular unions, um, you know, underneath the kind of national conversation. So you know, so it's so in one sense it's it's kind of hopeful uh, that there is you know I see some of this action going on, um, but at the same point, you know, for somebody who's you know, if you're concerned about getting quick action, right? I mean, it's a slow moving process and there's still this kind of um, um, opposition around it. That, the climate that change, climate uh, change and uh, and then just to pick up on uh, Tom's, Tom's co uh, comments around, you know, where we are seeing um, uh, some more kind of um, innovative, um, innovative action going on, right? I, you know, I, 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 you know, echo Harry's, comments that we are seeing some interesting kind of coalitions um, around kind of, you know, collective or semi-collective action. Um, but I think we have to th think about it differently. The, the thing that really struck me in the fall was uh, we saw Prop 22 being passed in California, but we also saw a, a fight for 15 base, $15 an hour minimum wage uh, proposition being successful in Florida, um, a state that Biden lost and the Democrats did poorly in. And yet by a significant margin, this $15 an hour minimum wage uh, passed. And it was interesting that the, the, uh, the key funding behind it came from a plaintiff attorney, a very wealthy plaintiff attorney in Florida, who uh, basically was the guy who got this on the ballot and pushed it through. And so so, you know, I think that kind of forces us a little bit to rethink who the actors are. I mean, that probably did more for uh, worker wages in the United States than anything unions have done in the last couple of years, right? Um, the, the fight for 15 campaigns has been the real surprise here. Sometimes the unions have been pushing that. I think in California and New York, the union action is key in getting those $15 an hour minimum wage things passed, but they're popping up over the course, uh, over the, the country, and they're including some of these new actors who were traditionally not part of our kind of vision of the field, right? These plaintiff attorneys are really big actors in America, and they traditionally weren't who we focused on. So, you know, I'm kind of with Tom's thought that the next generation of research needs to really start looking at some of these alternative uh, people acting on behalf of uh, labor and employees uh, that were outside of our kind of ambit of thinking in the past. Great, thanks. So now over to Johan and Asanda. Asanda, do you have any sponsor? Uh, otherwise, I'll do an answer. Um, uh, well, I mean, a short one, I suppose, uh, to the climate change. I, I've already written on the chat box that in my view, and I suppose I'm also simplifying the narrative of unions uh, in South Africa, that not much has been done in terms of concrete work in, in, in really unpacking and, and dealing with the impact of climate change on workers. Research has been commissioned and unions, in my view, they talk the talk, but in terms of concrete work that needs to happen, I've not seen much. Yes, there's been uh, links between unions and social movements, and all of them advocating for renewable energies, but not much beyond that. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, if, if um, carry on or otherwise I can add to that. Um, okay. Um, what, what I find is the, uh, the unions are, are very concerned about loss of jobs with, uh, especially with regard to climate change because most of our energy is still coal energy and we need to switch desperately to to solar and and wind energy and bring in private providers uh, to help uh, with escom as a national organization but the uh, the major union is concerned about loss of jobs and then there's also an ideological divide they're very socialist and communist even oriented and they want central state control and they don't want privatization uh, so, so uh, that also they oppose the the uh, uh, private sector coming into ESCOM, which is our national state uh, energy provider. So, so that's moving. It, we're moving very, very slowly away from coal electricity production to clean energy production. And sadly to say, the union is one of the biggest <laughs> obstacles, but not the only one. The, the, it's it the, the major union is also in a federation is also in a in a tripartite alliance with the ruling party uh, 
and and uh, the, the, many people in the ruling party are also of the same sort of socialist orientation and and not in favor of private sector but there is a big division within our ruling party uh, between those who are supporting private sector and those who are still terribly opposed to uh, uh, to bringing the private sector on board. Um, then the second point I want to make about uh, the question from, I think, Joel about is there any hopeful signs? Ironically, um, what we really need in South Africa is, is workplace forums, our works councils to get going, and we need uh, to, to change the legislation to make it favorable, more favorable for unions. Because as I see, the workplace forums bring about a harmony, as ways of common sitting down and solving problems together. Whereas I'm afraid our collective bargaining is terribly adversarial. There's both a class and a race differential already, and it's, it often ends in strikes and sometimes violent strikes with lots of the destruction of property even. And so we need to, 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 to develop uh, some form of works council where where both sides acknowledge their interdependence on each other and they look for common solutions to problems, as opposed to at the moment we hammer it out through through adversarial bargaining and try to to beat the other side. Thank you. All right, in our last two minutes, <laughs> some quick comments from um, Bant, and then we'll move back to the Canada team. <laughs> Bant? Bant, you're uh, muted. Okay. Well, first on Joel's comments on the um, fact that the institutions are not adapted to the crisis. I guess this is absolutely correct, but that's not you. I mean, let's think of digitalization. This discourse has been going on for more than a decade. So it, it's not you, it's just more obvious that we have to act, that we have to act soon. Um, on, on Gini and um, the, um, supply chain legislation. The problem is that a lot depends on the forthcoming general election and on the composition of the future coalition government. If this is going to be a conservative dominated government, then this will not mean a lot for supply chain legislation. But even if we get it passed, the problem will be, how will it be implemented, right? in thousands of firms throughout Asia, South America, and so on. So I would not be too optimistic for this uh, forthcoming legislation. Last but not least on, on Stephen and, and climate change. Yeah, that was an interesting decision by the Constitutional Court last week when it decided that the distribution of burden of the consequences of climate change is very uneven. Uh, and now within less than a week, all political parties submitted their plans uh, how these um, burdens or the, the distribution of burdens should be changed. But uh, the, the impact of, of trade unions has been very, very small. And climate change so far, at least this is my opinion, has not been a topic for, for trade unions. They are more uh, let's say, into legislation about supply chain and, and, and digitalization quite in general. So all in all, I would share this amount of, of careful skepticism instead of early indicators for profound change. Okay, thanks. And going over time, but making sure we give the Canadians their opportunity. Uh, Scott, Sean, and Daphne. Do you have some final comments? I'll make mine very quick and so my co-authors can, I, I see nothing on the horizon that gives me any joy in industrial relations in Canada. We can't even get our vaccines. So um, 
I, I don't see anything. Um, with regard to climate change, I, I find, and I say this as a dean with many years of watching students, the idea that climate change will come through unions, I find unions to the next generation, unions and climate change to be orthogonal thoughts. Um, so I see a lot of activism on climate change, a tremendous amount of, of activism on climate change, but I really don't see uh, unions leading it. And there's a limit to what we can expect unions to do. We're loading a lot of things onto unions and, and some of it may be diversionary, at least in a business unionism place to expect unions to solve everything. So um, those are my answers. Lots of interest in climate change, not through unions. I'll jump in quickly. And if I leave this call on a pessimistic note, I'm gonna go dig a shallow grave in my backyard. So here's a small ray of hope, although you have to look far and wide for it. The response to COVID has largely been successful in jurisdictions that have been able to uh, coordinate their institutions. And I think this bodes well for the labor movement in addressing some of the workplace problems that are arising. How's that? It's a bit of a stretch, but at least it's happy. Thank you. I'll oh. back over to you, Greg. <laughs> Greg, you're muted. We can't hear you. Thanks, Jenny. That's great. That's the that's the expression of the of the year, isn't it? Um, uh, going back to Tom's remarks, uh, he and I were both in another webinar earlier in the day, Australian time, and he was talking about the need for a, a new social contract and the uh, the opportunity that this crisis gives us, and, and we've touched on this in several of these contributions. So. So perhaps an optimistic note is that out of a crisis, a good thing can come and change can take place. So let, let's be optimistic, but let's keep contributing to those sorts of developments in our various countries and spheres of interest in theory and in practice. But thank you very much, Ginny, for moderating the discussion. Thank you, everyone, for contributing by attending and putting comments in the chat and questions and all of our panelists and as well as Tom for being a great discussant as usual and especially thank you to the great team at Lyra behind the scenes who make these webinars possible and lastly perhaps I can give a plug to the Lyra meetings coming up in in June that uh, many of us are looking forward to being present at on Zoom, although sorry, we're not going to be able to be there in practice. And also the International uh, ILERA Congress, where Harry Katz is the president-elect, is having its uh, World Congress a little later in June. But again, that will be only on Zoom. But there'll be opportunities for continuing these sorts of constructive dialogues, both in LIRA and in ILERA. So thank you, everyone. and. Good night or good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. And look forward to seeing you in person again, I hope, before too long. Cheers. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining. <laughs>